Uh, welcome, everyone. I think we can get going here. Just to note, we've got uh, two free seats up in front here. Peter, now one, now one, and all. So welcome. Great to have you with us uh, in this midsummer uh, time for this event today, Junipero Serra, the man behind the canonization controversy. I'm David DeCoste from the Markle Center for Applied Ethics here at Santa Clara, and we're very uh, pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education. You have evaluation forms at your seat. If you could please kindly fill them out at the conclusion of the event, that would be great. Also, please join us after the event in the lobby right outside the St. Clair room for some light refreshments. After the presentations today, there will be time for questions and discussion. Um, we ask you to please keep your comments or questions brief and to the point so we can get as many people in the conversation today as possible. Also, we have two handheld microphones that uh, Mike and Monica will be uh, have in the room here. So you put up your hand and Father Reese will call on you and we'd really like to amplify your questions so everyone can hear it. Uh, and also a special welcome to all those watching on our live web stream today. Uh, and uh, we will be posting a video of this event on both the Ignatian Center and Ethics Center websites within the next couple of days. Well, the moderator for our event today is perhaps well known to many of you, Father Tom Reese, a Jesuit since 1962, and this summer, and for the past summers, a visiting scholar at the Markle Center for Applied Ethics. Father Reese is presently a senior analyst at the National Catholic Reporter. Uh, just to call your attention to his excellent column on May 15th of this year um, called Junipero Serra, Saint or Not. Um, perhaps some helpful background or additional reflection on this important topic. Father Reese has his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in political science. You may not know this about him, but he is an expert on tax, tax reform and uh, happy, very happy to get into very extended conversations on that topic. Um, so they're interesting, I assure you. Uh, Father Reese, of course, was the editor-in-chief of America Magazine from 1998 to 2005. He's the author of a very highly regarded trilogy of books on politics and the Catholic Church called, the three of them, first, Archbishop, Inside the Power Structure of the American Catholic Church. The second is called A Flock of Shepherds, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. And the third, Inside the Vatican, the politics and organization of the Catholic Church. Father Reese is also, uh, last year, named by President Obama to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. We are always so pleased to have him with us each summer. Call your attention also on Monday, August 3rd at noon, he will be giving a talk on Pope Francis's kind of very electric um, papal encyclical that just came out on the environment. Please come back to campus for that. We'd love to have you here. Um, but we also really love having Father Reese here in the summers with us, always stimulating to our conversations. Um, and I'm sure he will be uh, stimulating to us today and is moderating our panel. So, Father Reese. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned uh, tax reform. Uh, I guess if there's one thing more controversial than uh, the canonization of Nidipro Serra, it probably would be tax reform. Uh, but anyway, thank you, uh, David, uh, for your gracious uh, introduction. Uh, the topic of our panel uh, this afternoon is Unipro Serra, uh, the Franciscan priest who will be canonized as a saint by Pope Francis in Washington, D.C. on September 23rd. Father Serra was responsible for founding many of the missions in uh, California. He visited the mission here, Santa Clara. Uh, I think he actually sent uh, two priests to found this mission, but he visited it frequently uh, until uh, uh, he died in Carmel in 1784 at the age of 70. 
The upcoming canonization of Junipero Serra is causing controversy as his supporters view him as a holy Franciscan who brought Christianity to the California Indians, while his opponents see him as a co-conspirator with the oppression of the Indians by the Spanish Empire. Who was Sarah? What should we think about him? To tell us about Junipero Serra, so that we can make up our own minds about him, are Rosemary Beebe and Robert Sankowitz, co-authors of Junipero Serra, California, Indians, and the Transformation of a Missionary. Uh, I believe there are copies of that book uh, will be on sale afterwards, but if, if they're not there, if it's already sold out, uh, you can order at your bookstore or get it online. Uh, both of our speakers are professors here at Santa Clara University, Bob in the uh, in history and Rosemary in Spanish. They are both extremely qualified to tell us about Junipero Serra, and we at the Marcellus Center are delighted uh, to sponsor uh, them in this panel. So, Robert and Rosemary. Do we need this big mic too? Okay. Because I have a good teacher voice and I probably don't even need a regular microphone. But uh. <clears throat> So we'd like to thank the uh, Markula Center and the Ignatian Center for um, having us here. Um, as Tom said at the, at the introduction, uh, Junipero Serra is about to be canonized by, uh, by Pope Francis. Um, this is a picture of uh, a mass in Rome at the beginning of May where Pope Francis is being presented with a relic of Junipero Serra by Archbishop uh, Jose Horacio Gomez, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, and one of the major supporters of Father Serra's canonization. On the other side, uh, there are a number of, of groups. This is a Facebook group, of all things. Uh, no Sainthood for Serra. It's got over 1,000 members. Uh, and the arguments against Father Sarah's canonization are very much um, in evidence in, in this and other kinds of, uh, of groups. As Tom said, it's a very contentious kind of issue. Junipero Serra has always been a person uh, among, uh, uh, around whom a lot of contention and, and legends and stories have, have clustered. For example, back in the 1950s, uh, Stanford University Press uh, published a book uh, Fray Junipero Serra, the Great Walker. And, and the, the, the argument of the book was that once Serra landed in Veracruz, Mexico, he never rode again. He, he never rode a horse or a mule. He walked thousands of miles up and down New Spain. That happens not to be true, but look at the... <laughs> uh, the Serra's always pictured with a walking staff. And indeed, one of the great um, quotes that's always attributed to Serra is, Siempre adelante... Nunca atrás, always forward, never back. Uh, this comes from a paraphrase of a, of a letter that, that Sarah wrote, uh, which we'll be uh, talking about in a few minutes. But as far as we can tell, uh, the number of times that Father Sarah actually said that phrase, siempre adelante, nunca atrás, is zero. <laughs> so we want to try, what, what we try to do in, in our book is, is look at Sarah the individual, to get behind all of these, all of these stories, all of these myths, all of these tales, and let the man himself talk to us. What we're going to try to do today is to help you discover the essence of Sarah the man, the man that we discovered through 10 years of work translating his writings from Spanish to English. I know my own family recently lost a family member, and uh, my parents were going through my aunt's things, and they found letters and, and different documents that they didn't know existed. And they were reading these letters, and they discovered so much more about my aunt that none of us knew. And I, when this happened in our family, I thought, this is like what, what happened when I was reading Sarah's writings. I discovered so much about him. Uh, 
the, the amazing range and depth of human emotions that come out in his writings, it, it's, it's just incredible. And we as human beings can identify with this. I really gained an enormous appreciation for this man's intellect. He was amazing. There are times when you're reading a letter and you're thinking, did he have this giant thesaurus in his brain where he's picking out specific words to convince uh, the intended recipient of a letter? And there are times when I was glad that I was not the recipient of that letter because he can be very fiery. He can be very uh, frustrating to read. Uh, there are other times when I was reading a letter and I thought, I'm in the presence of a professor here. Uh, he took me back to my days here at Santa Clara in Father Norman Martin's history class. I just felt like, oh wow, I've got the prop here. The, the man who held the chair of scotistic philosophy at the Lulian University in Mallorca. Other times in his writings, we can hear the voice of a conflicted soul who's trying to, to comfort a fellow missionary who is distraught because he's so lonely working in the missions in Baja California. And then there were letters in which Junipero Serra was the son. He was trying to come to grips with how to, to deal with the conflicting emotions in his heart when he knew that he would not be seeing his parents again when he left Spain. I have a letter, an excerpt of a letter I'd like to read to you. Before setting sail from Cadiz to cross the Atlantic, Serra wrote a very touching letter to a priest in Mallorca in which he expressed how he felt about maybe never seeing his parents again. The language that he conveyed is a mix of sadness, a mix of joy, anticipation, regret, enthusiasm, and melancholy. And this is what he wrote on August 20th, 1749. My beloved friend, I am at a loss for words, yet overwhelmed by emotion as I depart. I beg you once again to comfort my parents. I know they will be greatly affected by my leaving. I wish I could instill in them the great joy that I am experiencing because I believe they would urge me to go forth and never turn back. When Sarah arrived in Baja California, he kept an extensive diary of his journey from Baja California to San Diego. This document is the longest text composed by Sarah that has survived, and in many ways it is the most personal. In many of the diary entries, we can clearly see that Sarah had a sense of humor. And I've said this so many times to people, that Sarah was funny. He had an amazing sense of humor. And they look at me like, what? They think of this statue in the Mission Gardens of this sort of stoic little man. He was hilarious. He could be witty. He could be dry. He could be sarcastic. And at times, he could even be childlike. In the following example, taken from the June 19, 1769, entry in his diary, Sarah describes what happened to a burro. And he does a play on words with the word homicidio, or homicide, in Spanish. So listen to what he has to say. It really is quite cute. On today's journey, one of the Señor Gobernador's servants, a Genoese cook, showed the strength of his sword by thrusting it through the hindquarters of a she-ass because the animal had the audacity of cutting in front of the cook when he was riding, thus slowing him down. The she-ass died at the cook's feet. The señor gobernador was convinced a crime had been committed based on the statements of eyewitnesses and the confession of the man who committed the burricide. Get it? Burricidio, burricide? It's cute. Now, in an excerpt from a letter written during the last days of March 1769 from Loreto, Baja California, we get a taste of Sarah's stinging sarcasm, as well as his concern for his own creature comforts, as he was about to undertake the journey that would enable him to work among those who had not been baptized. He said, I lingered at the mission for a variety of reasons. For me, the most important reason for stopping was to express my gratitude. The fact is that the only provisions I took from my mission in Loreto for such a long journey were a loaf of bread and a piece of cheese. During the year I was there, I had no say with regard to temporal matters. I was treated as a mere guest of the Señor Real Comisario, who lavished me with crumbs. However, Reverendo Padre Palou more than made up for this insult. 
He generously provided me with food, clothing for my own use, and other amenities for my journey. I could not bring myself to reflect upon whether I should take all that he had given me or consider leaving any of it behind. For being the sinner that I am, I am still attached to my creature comforts. Junipero Serra was born on the island of Mallorca in the Mediterranean in 1713. He was born in the village of Petra on the eastern side of the island. Petra, like um, many Spanish towns and villages, didn't have one church. It had two churches. Uh, the church there on the right is San Pedro, where Serra was baptized. And the church on the left here was San Bernardino. That's where he went to grammar school in a grammar school that was administered by the Franciscans. And the memory of growing up in Petra never left him. In fact, the first baptism that he did when he came to California, in San Carlos and Monterey, this is how he put it in the baptismal register. On December 26, 1770, in the church of this mission, San Carlos and Monterey, I solemnly baptized a boy about five years old the son of Gentile parents who willingly presented him to the Catholic Church, and I named him Bernardino de Jesus. So he names the boy after the grammar school that he had gone to in, in Petra. One of the uh, devotions in the village of Petra was a devotion to the Virgin Mary under the title of Our Lady of Bonani. Bonani is Catalan for when on your good year. Uh, that goes back to the early 17th century when Petra and Mallorca was experiencing a drought. The villagers built a shrine to Mary on top of a local hill and prayed for an end to the drought. And in 1609, which was named the good year, the rains came and attributed to Mary. It so happened that in Carmel in 1782, there was a drought. And one of the baptisms that Sarah does at Carmel in 1782 he writes it this way. On September 3rd, 1782, in the church of this mission, San Carlos de Monterrey, I solemnly baptized a girl, about 13 years old, the daughter of Gentile parents from Sargenta Ruc. I gave her the name Maria de Buen Año, in honor of Most Holy Mary of my beloved homeland. So he's clearly praying to Mary through this baptism to do in Carmel the same thing that he had believed she did in Petra a couple of centuries earlier. When Sarah was 16 years old, he left Petra and moved to Palma, the capital of Mallorca, which is down here, uh, and he entered the Franciscan order. He's ordained a priest um, in, um, um, in, in Mallorca, and he lives for a number of years at this place. He lives actually at the Church of San Francisco in, in Palma, is the place in his life where Sarah lived the longest and most continuously. Uh, the statue of Sarah wasn't there when... Uh, <laughs> He becomes a very, very eminent and well-known teacher and preacher on the island of Mallorca. He becomes, as Rosemary said at the beginning, he becomes the holder of the, Sco the chair of Scotistic philosophy, a chair which was named after um, uh, John Dunn Scotus, uh, a, a 13th century Franciscan thinker. Uh, he lives in this convent of, of San Francisco for 20 years. One of the highlights of the Church of San Francisco was the tomb of a, of a well-known Mallorcan named Ramon Lur. He was a member of the Third Order of St. Francis who had traveled to North Africa to preach among the Muslims of Northern Africa. Lur had even set up on Mallorca a school to train future missionaries in the Arabic language. So Mallorca had, w was on the center of a number of trade routes in the Mediterranean, and it was kind of an outward-looking kind of place. Uh, St. Francis himself had traveled to northern Africa during one of the Crusades and had preached to the Sultan of Egypt. So missionary activity was both rooted in Mallorca and was rooted in the Franciscan order that Sarah, of which Sarah was a member. He studied the, th the thought of John Duns Scotus, a uh, 13th century Franciscan, um, Franciscan philosopher and theologian who championed the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, we don't have very much of an indication of, of Sarah's own writings when he was at Mallorca. We have some class notes that students took and things like that. But what we do have are four sermons that he preached in 1744 to a convent of poor Clares in Palma. And what he does is he takes their Lenten sermons 
And he takes as his theme a verse from one of the Psalms, Psalm 33, taste and see that the Lord is good. And this is how he develops in those sermons. This is how he develops that theme. Anyone who has tasted the sweetness of the Lord just once regards as empty all this life's pleasures and delights, if they even deserve to be called these. Those who do not know anything about this sweetness and do not taste it do not have any appetite for it. But someone who has tried it just once discovers that he has an increasing appetite for it, for he finds it very soothing. As the Lord himself says, those who eat of me will hunger for more, and those who drink of me will thirst for more. So God is kind of a culinary delight, a culinary sweetness. And the notion is before you've tasted it, you have no idea. But once you taste it, you acquire gradually but inexorably an increasing taste for it, and you can't be satisfied. This is the kind of missionary strategy that Sarah will adopt when he comes to California. He wants gradually but inexorably to introduce people to the sweetness of God. Sarah also, in another uh, of these sermons, used another set of, of, of analogies which are going to be important when he comes to California. And this is the analogy of God as a stern father. And this is what he says. But you will say... How can the tender love of a father for his child be reconciled with punishing and afflicting him? Actually, a harmony between love and strictness is what characterizes a true father. It is precisely because the father loves him that he teaches him to obey. When he misbehaves, the father scolds and punishes him so that the son can correct his mistakes. In this way, even though it might seem at first glance that the son is his father's slave, it becomes clear that he is his father's deeply beloved son. The divine father behaves in a similar way with men, who are his own sons. And Sarah used another analogy, uh, the, the analogy of a doctor and patient, to drive home the same point in these sermons. So tell me, which doctor loves his patients? The one who treats them with bitter liquids and bleeding? Or the one who indulges his patients' whims and does not forbid anything that the patient's corrupted taste might long for. Those of you who've been to Kaiser lately, what would your doctor say? The first one or the second one? This is your quiz. You're flunking. Certainly you will answer the first one, right? The bitter liquids. Sarah would be disappointed. Along with about 99% of the people in Europe at the time, Sarah believed that Europeans were superior to natives of America. And the missions were frankly paternalistic institutions. And when Sarah gets there, he will regard himself as a loving but stern father. Somewhere, you know, Sarah is a very, very popular figure in Mallorca. But sometime, he's in his mid-30s, he begins to ask himself, is this all that there is? And as a Franciscan and a Mallorcan, to renew himself, it's natural for him to think of the missions. And in 1749, he leaves Mallorca, and he ends up uh, in, um, he goes across the ocean and ends up in Veracruz in Mexico. He does walk from Veracruz to Mexico City, about 200 miles, and that's what gives rise to this legend that he never wrote anything uh, again. Uh, he takes up residence here at the missionary headquarters of the Franciscans in Mexico City, the Colegio de San Fernando, which is still in existence. Uh, he remains associated with this institution for the rest of his life. Six months after he arrives there, he is sent to a, an area about 250 miles north of Mexico City in the general area of Querétaro, an area called the Sierra Gorda. It's inhabited by a group of um, missionary uh, uh, Indians whom the Aztecs had called Chichimecas, which is a derogatory term, um, sons of dogs or something like that. The, the Pame people among whom Sarah ministered um, lived in a region that was kind of a transitional region between the more settled and sedentary groups in the central Mexico and the more nomadic groups in, in the northern part of Mexico. And the Chichimecas, uh, are the, the Pame Indians were Chichimecas, and Sarah spends eight years ministering in the Sierra Gorda. Uh, the first mission that the Franciscans had founded there was San Jose de Visaron, which they founded in, in 1740. 
But for at least three of the eight years that Sarah is in the Sierra Gorda, he's president of five uh, important uh, Sierra Gorda missions. And here they are. This is uh, Santa Maria del Agua de Landa, uh, Santiago de Jalpan, which is this one here. That's where he lived uh, during the eight years. Uh, uh, San Miguel Conca, and finally, uh, Nuestra Señora de la Luz de Tan Criol. Uh, these missions, uh, the great stone facades, which you see in these pictures, uh, are, are beautiful. And at least some of them were started during the time that Sarah was president of the Sierra Gorda missions. They are stunning. And in 2003, these five missions were declared a World Heritage Cultural Site by, by UNESCO. These pictures, though, are... Oh, these pictures were taken by my colleague, Stephanie Daffer, and her husband. And Stephanie's here, so I wanted to give her a plug. We're very grateful for that. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> in 1758, after having been in the Sierra Gorda for eight years, Sarah is recalled to Mexico City, and he's told, you're going to Texas. The Comanche Indians had destroyed a mission, San Saba, uh, which was about a couple of hundred miles north of San Antonio. Two of the missionaries were killed, and Sarah, sa Sarah is told that he and another missionary are going to go to replace them. Well, as it turns out, uh, the Spanish sent a military detachment to pacify the Comanches before the mission was, would, would be reopened. Uh, the Comanches pacified the Spanish military detachment instead, and San Saba was never reopened. So Sarah spent the next eight years in Mexico City basically preaching a series of revival missions going around from parish to parish where they were, where they were um, uh, invited by the local bishop, trying to stir up religious fervor in parishes where the clergy and the bishops thought that that fervor had kind of waned. Uh, he, he preaches in about 20 places, at least that we know of, uh, throughout Mexico uh, during this period, all the way down from Oaxaca uh, up here to, uh, to the Villa de Valles area. During part of that, at, at one point there, he becomes involved in an inquisition case. In one of these villages, one woman had accused another woman of witchcraft. The woman was a healer, and, and somebody else had gone to her, and it didn't work. And Sarah is called in to kind of take testimony from the accuser and the accused. As it turns out, the woman who's doing the accusing was a mulata, somebody who had mixed Spanish and Indian ancestry, and the, the accuser, uh, the accused, was a loba, somebody who had African blood in them as, uh, as well. And in taking this testimony, Sarah becomes acquainted firsthand with the kind of religious syncretism, the mix of imported Spanish, European Christianity, and indigenous religious folkways, which marked the religious life of so many indigenous people in New Spain. Uh, and here we have uh, a, a great example of this. This is from a Catholic church in Hidalgo in Mexico, where one of the decorations of, on the wall of the church is an Aztec jaguar warrior. And you can see the way in which the, the two traditions get intermingled. In 1767, Sarah is once again recalled to Mexico City when he's preaching one of these missions. He's told the Jesuits have been expelled from Spain and the Spanish Empire by the king. The Franciscans have been assigned to take over the Jesuit missions in Baja, California, and you're leaving right away. And so in 1768, Sarah arrives at Loreto, which was the former Jesuit headquarters in Baja, California. He loves the idea of going to Baja, California for very, one very simple reason. He's been in the New World for 18 years now. And he came over to be a missionary. But he's never really had the opportunity to preach the gospel to unbaptized people. The Pame Indians, among whom he worked in the Sierra Gorda, had already been evangelized before he got there. And everybody that he met on these revival missions that he was preaching was already a baptized Catholic. So he jumps at the opportunity to get to Baja, California, because he knows that the Jesuits have been expanding their mission frontier northward. But it gets even better than that. For a couple of months after Sarah arrives in Baja, California, this uh, man, Jose de Galvez, who has a, a very elaborate title called Visitor General, appointed by the King of Spain. Visitor General to New Spain. It's a kind of an odd title, but it was spelled B-O-S-S. -S. 
He basically, he outranked the viceroy. He comes to Baja, California and tells Serra that the Spanish government has decided to extend the frontier even farther north, up to San Diego and beyond, to forestall possible Russian advances, because the Spanish ambassador in Moscow had picked up word that the Russians were going across Siberia. If they get to Alaska, they could go down the coast very, very quickly. And Spain wanted to establish its presence there before the Russians got there. So Sarah jumps at this chance. And in 1769, in the spring, he leaves Loreto and begins to head north. Uh, he goes first to this area, Mission San Francisco Javier, a beautiful stone church in the mountains of, of Baja, California. And you can see how, how uh, rugged the terrain is. He continues going up north through the old Jesuit missions, Mission Guadalupe, uh, Mission Santa Gertrudis, uh, Mission La Purísima Concepción, the Immaculate Conception, uh, and finally gets to the last of the Jesuit missions, Santa Maria, up in the frontier of the northern Baja California. The next stop is the, the place where uh, the governor, Gaspar de Portola, had arranged for the expedition to have its staging area. It was at a place called Velicata. And what happens at Velicata transforms the rest of Sarah's stay in Baja California and basically the rest of his life. Because never in his life, as Bob had said, never in his life had Sarah encountered unbaptized and unmissionized Indians. And when he finally did, it was on May 15, 1769, and it was here at Velicata. He was so overcome with emotion when I read this to you, see if you can picture the scene in your mind. It's, it's, it's a transformational moment for Sarah. For me, it was a day of great consolation. Soon after the masses were said, while I was quiet with my thoughts in the small hut that was my dwelling place, they alerted me that the Gentiles were approaching and that they were close. I praised God, kissed the ground, and gave thanks to our Lord for granting me this opportunity to be among the Gentiles in their land after longing for this for so many years. I saw what I could hardly believe when I would read about it or when I would be told about it, which was that the Gentiles were totally naked, like Adam in paradise before the fall. That is how they went about, and that is how they presented themselves to us. We interacted with them for quite some time, and not once did they show any sign of embarrassment seeing that we were clothed and they were not. I placed my hands on the head of each Gentile, one at a time, as a sign of affection. Sarah faithfully kept the diary all the way up until he got to San Diego. And in the diary, you can see his enthusiasm as he's getting into the territory of unbaptized people. And he, he sees that the possibilities of evangelization are finally going to be available for him. Uh, near the present site of the city of Ensenada, he has this encounter. It seems to me that even though we have seen many Indians, we have not seen so many gather together in one place as we have here. And as to their friendly nature, I cannot find the appropriate words to describe it. In addition to the countless number of men, a large group of women and children sat around me in a circle. One of the women wanted me to hold the infant that she was nursing. I held him in my arms for a while so wishing that I could baptize him. But I then return the child to his mother. I make the sign of the cross, and I bless each of them. I have them say, Jesus and Mary. I give them what I am able to give and cherish them in the best way I can. And a few days later, at the site of what is now Rosarito Beach uh, in Baja, California, this is how he describes his encounter with the native peoples. When I give them something to eat, they usually tell me with very clear gestures that they don't want that. Instead, they want me to give them my holy habit, and they grab me by the sleeve. If I had given the habit to all who requested it, I already would have a large community of Gentile friars. <laughs> On June the 1st, 1769, Sarah and Portola arrive in San Diego. Here's the page of Sarah's diary where he describes it, and you can see Puerto de San Diego, Gracias a Dios, Port of San Diego, thanks be to God. It's like sending an email in capital letters. You know, he's really, really excited about this. Um, Portola 
once San Diego has been occupied, immediately turns its attention to occupying the second object of the expedition, the port of Monterey. He organizes a land journey up to Monterey. They, they actually end up at Monterey, but they don't realize they're there. They keep going farther north. They accidentally uh, become the first Europeans to see San Francisco Bay. They get back down, uh, reporting to Sarah that they were unable to find Monterey. But the next year, another land and sea expedition finds Monterey, and on June the 3rd, 1770, um, Sarah found the uh, La found the Presidio, and Sarah found the mission of San Carlos. We don't know what exactly the scene looked like, but we can be absolutely sure that it did not look like this. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> this is a painting in 1877 of a very idealized kind of thing. But Sarah is, is, is there. You know where the Monterey Presidio is. It's where the, where the State Historic Park is, and, and the, the, the Presidio is on Church Street. Um, Sarah, literally two weeks after he gets there, he is convinced that this is not a good place for a mission. And this is what he says. There is no Indian village at all in the vicinity of this port. Because of this, if we see that the Indians are determined to accept our holy faith, we need to recognize the special difficulty they will have in taking up residence here. It might be necessary to leave the Presidio and with a few soldiers of the escort, move the mission close to the Carmel River, two short leagues to the south. It is a truly splendid location, capable of producing abundant crops because of the plentiful and excellent land and water. Now this is two weeks after he's arrived in Monterey, and it's really important. Uh, the, the normal reason why Sarah is, is said to have moved the mission from Monterey to Carmel is because of trouble with soldiers and stuff like that. And yeah, certainly there were. But the basic reason is it can be seen in, the, in this map. You know, here's where Sarah is. Where are the Indians? The Indians aren't stupid. They're not living up there. They're living where any of us would live if we could, the Carmel Valley. You know? <laughs> and that's where he wants the mission to be. And so in 1771, he actually moves the mission from Monterey to Carmel. Um, Sarah gets into a series of fights with the military commander, whose name was Pedro Fajes. Finally, he goes down to Mexico City, takes a journey down to Mexico City. He gets a personal audience with the viceroy. He gets the viceroy to replace Fajes as military commander. And then he comes back up to, he sails back to San Diego. And then from San Diego to Carmel, he travels overland. He's got with him uh, a young Indian boy whom he had taken to Mexico City whom he had baptized with the name Juan Evangelista, John the Evangelist. And Sarah describes as he's getting closer to Carmel some conversations that he's had with Juan. He wants to ask Juan, what do your people think of us? I asked Juan Evangelista if when he and his people saw us, that is, the padres, soldiers, and officers, if they had ever imagined such a land where everybody wore clothing. Juan said no. They believed all lands to be like theirs. And with respect to the soldiers and the padres, after they had taken a long, hard look at them, they believed them to be the sons of the mules that were carrying them. <laughs> I replied that, according to that belief, he and his people probably imagined there were lands where mules give birth to men and they give birth to clothing. Juan said no, but rather the elders said they had come out from under the ground and that they were the souls, in their ways of understanding, of the old Gentiles from that area who had reappeared in that manner. However, he now recognized that none of that was true, and he would tell that to his people. See, what's, what's happening here is that Juan had just been, spent a couple of months in Mexico City, and he had heard all the stories which were current among the Spanish in Mexico City about what the Aztecs first thought when they saw Spanish soldiers, that the, the horse and the, and the rider were one being. And Juan says, no, 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 nobody believes that. What we believed was that, was that the mules were your parents. <laughs> so he's trying to assert, what, what, what he's doing is he's trying to assert the prevalence and the importance of indigenous traditions uh, in the midst of all of this kind of thing. The year and a half after Sarah came back from Mexico City were the happiest years of his life. He really believes that he is in the process of creating a multi-ethnic Christian community on the banks of the Carmel River. 
Uh, there are a whole bunch of things that happen, but they're symbolized by an event that he describes in the summer of 1775. The harvesting of the wheat began on July 18th. It had to be prolonged until August 11th, because as soon as the harvesting began, so many sardines appeared on the beach near the mission that we found it necessary to harvest wheat until noon and then gather sardines in the afternoon. This lasted for 20 consecutive days. After two weeks of meatless meals, the following Sunday, the Indians took a break from eating sardines and went out as a group to look for the young birds that were the size of a large hen. They spent that Sunday camped out on the beach of Carmel, divided up into countless little groups, each with its own fire upon which they roasted the birds, and then they ate. I went with two other padres to see the gathering. It was a period of contentment, a beautiful setting. See, so this picture of you know, the, the, the work schedule being roughly evenly divided between traditional things, gathering sardines, and imported things, harvesting wheat, the priest kind of going down to the beach and wandering among Rumson Ohlone community gatherings. This picture may be a little bit of an idealized picture, but it's the kind of community that Sarah wanted to form, and he thought he was in the process of forming. But Sarah's world came to a dramatic change on the night of December 13, 1775. On that night, 8 o'clock in the evening, the commander of the Presidio at Monterey, Fernando de Rivera y Moncada, personally rode the couple of miles in the darkness from the Monterey Presidio to the Carmel Mission. There he told Sarah that he had just received word that Mission San Diego had been destroyed by a large attack of Kumeyaay fighters, and that one of the missionary priests, Father Luis Jaime, a fellow Mallorcan, uh, had been killed by the, uh, by the Kumeyaay people. Uh, that got Sarah thinking about what, what would happen if he himself had been killed by Indians. One of the most important things I requested of the Visitor General at the beginning of these conquests was that if the Indians were to kill me, whether they be Gentiles or Christians, they should be forgiven. It is only right that for as long as the missionary is alive, the soldiers should guard and watch over him as God would guard the apple of his eye. But if they have already killed the missionary, what are we going to gain with military campaigns? I'm saying, so that others are not killed, guard the missionaries better than you guarded the deceased, and let the murderer live so he can be saved, which is the purpose of our coming here and the reason for forgiving him. Help him to understand, with some moderate punishment, that he is being pardoned in accordance with our law, which orders us to forgive offenses and to prepare him, not for his death, but for eternal life. And the military did chase after the ringleaders of the rebellion. Rivera y Moncada went to San Diego. He was joined there by Juan Bautista de Anza. And they, they, they went after some of the, the ringleaders. And this brings up the notion of how Indians were punished and treat, treated in, in, in the missions and how they were punished. I think it needs to be you know, acknowledged that one thing that missionaries didn't do very well uh, was tell Indian people clearly that from the point of view of the missionaries and from the point of view of Catholic theology, baptism was a lifetime commitment. And once you decided to enter the mission community, you had embarked on a one-way street. There was way in, but not out. It's pretty clear that this was not really clearly explained to the native peoples as they were being prepared for, for baptism. And so what would happen is that a lot of times uh, people would want to leave the missions. Sometimes they would get permission from the local priest to do so, but they had to return within a specified time. If they did not return, or if they did not return on time, they were deemed fugitives, and the missionary would ask soldiers and other Indians to go out and capture them and bring them back. And this is how Sarah described one of these events in Carmel in 1775. Last Friday, I sent 11 adults to the mountains in search of my lost sheep. Last night, they brought back to me nine neophytes from this mission. I am sending four of them to you for punishment, a period of time in exile, and two or three rounds of whipping. This should be a good lesson for them as well as for the others, and it will be of spiritual benefit for everyone, which is the goal of our efforts. If you do not have shackles on hand, if you would let us know, 
they can be sent from here. I believe their punishment should last one month. So the punishment for fugitivism was flogging. Flogging was the basic punishment in the Spanish army and the basic punishment in frontier areas like California controlled by the Spanish army. But the flogging was meant to be painful and it was meant to be uh, deterrence. Um, Sarah generally, genuinely thought of, of himself as a stern father and the Indians would understand what he was trying to do. It's very unlikely from what we know about the way in which Indian child rearing practices took place, it's very unlikely that that perception was shared by the native, by the native peoples. And when you read words like, like, like Rosemary just read, hey, you know, talking to the military commander, hey, if you don't have enough shackles at the Presidio, we have plenty at the mission we can lend you. That's kind of very, very um, disturbing and upsetting. And it points to what is generally a very, very dark side of the mission experience. But flogging was the basic way in which, um, in which um, um, Indians were punished. And nobody disagreed with that, the military or the priest. They all agreed that flogging was appropriate. In a letter to the governor, Sarah, descri a, Sarah described a conversation that he had with the governor about this very topic. I told him that everyone is aware of the temperament of those Indians, to which he responded, well, flog them. I responded, well, even for that we need troops in order to carry it out without fear. Sir, give the padres some assistance, to which he responded, they can do without it. There is no reason for it, things being as they are. Now, many people think that, that flogging was related to a penitential practice that Sarah and a number of members of religious orders practiced on themselves, the practice of, of flagellation. Flagellation had a, self-flagellation had a long history in Europe. It apparently started in monasteries in the Middle Ages. It flares up, uh, especially during times of plague and pestilence, like the, uh, like the Black Death. And Sarah, along with members of many religious orders, routinely did this. Uh, but it was a different kind of, uh, of thing. Uh, it was when, 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 when Sarah did it, uh, and, and, the, and the monks and the flagellants did it, they were expressing a symbolic identification with Christ, who was flogged before he was crucified. The punishment that the Indians was given out was a different kind of thing, and the missionaries knew this. Sarah appealed at one point to a story that was prevalent in missionary circles relating to Hernan Cortez. And the story was this, that some Indians in Tlaxcala were once whipped for being late for mass. This upset the Tlaxcalan Indians very, very much. They felt that they were being signaled out. And so according to this story, Cortez arranged with the priest that he himself would be late for mass next Sunday, and he would allow himself to be publicly flogged so that the Indians could see that they were not being singled out. Now, this story only appears, as I say, in missionary um, accounts, but the fact that it does appear indicates that even the missionaries felt it necessary to justify the punishment of flogging, which was such a standard kind of uh, punishment. The last number of years of Sarah's life were, were, were contentious ones. He was fighting with another governor, Felipe de Neve. Neve wanted to found pueblos, towns. Sarah did not like that at all. He hated the foundation of San Jose. And the only thing he hated more than the foundation of San Jose was the foundation a couple of years later of Los Angeles. Didn't like that at all. He felt that, that the settlers in these towns would give Indians the wrong idea, that the Indians would be too independent in these towns, and that they would be outside of the orbit of the priests. The, the thing that really got Sarah going his last couple of years was, was going through the missions, administering the sacrament of confirmation. This gave him a chance to personally encounter virtually every baptized Indian. And by the time of his death, there were about 6,000 of them in California. But by this time, he's in his late 60s and he's beginning to slow down. And at the end of one confirmation journey, his friend Francisco Palou, who had been the founder of Mission Dolores in San Francisco, recounts a meeting that he and Sarah had in the summer of 1784 at Mission Santa Clara. Even though I was thinking about going back to my mission, he stopped me from leaving. He said he wanted to prepare for his death in case we would not see one another again, for he was already feeble and he probably did not have much time left to live. 
He spent several days in spiritual exercises and made a general confession, or repeated the one he had made at other times. He shed many tears, and I know fewer. I was upset that this might be the very last time we would see one another. It wasn't the last time, it was the next to last time. In August, the third week of August of 1784, the missionaries at Carmel sent word to Palou to hurry to Carmel because Sarah was failing fast. This is how Palou describes that in his biography of Sarah. As I read to you earlier, Sarah was never afraid to die. And again, he is not afraid to speak of his own death in these passages. When he actually faces death on August 28, 1784, he does it in what I would call typical Sarah fashion in his own way. Capitan and Comandante Don Jose Canizares whom he knew very well ever since the first expedition in 1769, and the royal chaplain, Don Cristobal Diaz, whom he had also met in this port in 1779, arrived at the mission. He gave them an extraordinary welcome by ordering the solemn ringing of the bells in their honor. He stood up and warmly embraced them as if he were not ill and engaged in the customary formalities of respect that a religious would afford such officers. After listening to their stories, he said, Well, senores, after so much time that has passed since we last saw one another, and after all of your travels, I thank you for coming to this port from so far away to throw a bit of earth on top of me. When everyone who was present heard this, we were all surprised. There he was, seated on his small chair made of reeds, answering every question, his mind as sharp as ever. As soon as he was finished, I told him it was already past one o'clock in the afternoon, and I asked him if he would like to have a cup of broth. He said yes, and took it. After giving thanks, he said, well, we must now rest. He walked on his own to the small room where he had his bed, which was more like a bench. After taking off only his mantle, he lay down on the boards that were covered with the blanket and his holy cross so he could rest. We all thought he was going to sleep since he had not slept at all during the entire night. The gentleman went out to eat. I was a bit worried, so a short time later I returned to his room and went over to his bed to see if he was sleeping. I found him exactly as we had left him just a short while before, but now he was asleep in the Lord. He showed no signs of having struggled. The only evidence of death was that his breathing had stopped, but it really did seem like he was sleeping. We piously believe that he went to sleep in the Lord a little before two o'clock in the afternoon on the feast day of San Agustin, August 28th, in the year 1784, and that he would be receiving his heavenly reward for his apostolic labors. Well, Hini Sarah, as you all know, had a very active afterlife. Um, Palou wrote his biography, which was pub uh, Palou returned to, to Mission Dolores in San Francisco, and there wrote the draft of basically the first book ever written in California, which was a biography of Sarah. Uh, the book was published in Mexico City in 1787, and Sarah becomes kind of, over, over time, especially under the influence of the Spanish revival movement, he becomes kind of a virtual symbol of much of what happens in California before the gold rush. Uh, by 1882, there's his body being, uh, being uh, unearthed uh, as, the, um, as the Carmel mission is being, is being done. This next picture is uh, the, the iconic picture of him. It was actually painted in the 1920s. It was painted by a Mexican priest, Father Jose Mosqueda, who said that he copied it from a picture that was on the walls at the Franciscan house in Querétaro, but that the, the, the painting had been destroyed during the turbulence of the Mexican Revolution of the 1910s. We don't know if that's true or not, but this picture has become kind of the iconic picture of Sarah, and the iconic mission uh, has become Mission Carmel. This picture is very special to me and to my family. It says there, as seen through the eyes of Manuel Mayafre Sunier, a Catalonian master stonemason. That was my grandfather. He took this picture in 1949, and my dad is here in the audience, and he's a witness because he was there with my granddad. I wasn't born yet, and he wasn't my dad yet, 
So I think my dad was trying to score some good points with the future father-in-law so he could tell you about how this picture was taken. But why this picture is important, not only from a family standpoint, it's important because my grandfather knew what it meant to work with the earth, to work with his hands, to work with the soil, and he created uh, structures with, with bricks. He was somebody who needed to be around the materials before constructing something. There is a church here in, in San Jose. It's the Stone Presbyterian Church over on Clark Way. My grandfather was the stonemason who did the sanctuary. He, he, he built that. He did all the stonework. And he, before putting any stone up, he spent the night with all the stones around him. He slept in that sanctuary with all of the stones because they were living things to him. And he really wanted to feel these stones. I mention this to you because I had, Bob and I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago to meet a Mission Indian descendant, a woman by the name of Carla. She was up at Mission Dolores, and she was talking about the Indian legacy of the missions and, how, and what this meant to her as a descendant. And she said, in our belief, when we pass on, we become one with the soil. We become one with the trees, with the mud, with the logs. And all of this, all of these materials, she said, my ancestors used all of these materials in building the missions. It was the Indians who provided the labor. They're the ones who built the missions. And she said, in our belief, we become part of these materials. So we are part of the mission walls. So in the future, if you have the opportunity to visit any missions, go to Carmel, any of the other missions here in California. We hope that you will remember that, that the indigenous people built the missions and they are part of the walls. We also hope that if you go to Carmel, when you gaze at the grave of Saint Junipero Serra, what will you see? We hope that our research can help you see that this is a multi-dimensional man and he is not simply a cardboard figure or a cartoon character. He is not a faultless hero or an unreconstructed villain. Now, people are going to continue to contest the legacy of Junipero Serra, like with all historical figures. That's just the way, uh, the way it is. Uh, he will continue to be reinterpreted, and he will continue to be reevaluated. But we hope that, that our particular book will enable people to see Serra as a complex individual who lived in a very, very challenging era. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Rosemary and, and Bob. Uh, we certainly have a much deeper appreciation and understanding of Unipra Serra now. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions and responses and discussion. And uh, David, you'll wave at me when it's time to uh, call it uh, call it a day. Uh, as moderator, I get the first. Uh, I get the, one of the advantages of being moderator is you get to ask the question. I'm just curious, Rosemary. I should have warned you that this question was coming. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm just. But I was thinking about it as as you read all of this material. Did you get any kind of an impression of, of uh, you know, Priscilla's attitudes towards women? Uh, <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I'm, yeah, obviously, he's probably a man of his times, but I'm, I'm just curious. Well, you know, whenever he wrote about women, he was writing about indigenous women, and there was always respect uh, in terms of how he described them. But no, there is one letter. Thank you for that question. I just thought of it. Remember that letter where he says the women just talk too much? <laughs> yeah. I remember that, that, that. I had forgotten about that he one. He was talking about a group of, uh, of Indian women in Baja, California. And he said in Rosemary's translation, they are chattering inanely as women are wont to do. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so he's a man of his time. So, yeah, so there was that one instance. That, uh, I had forgotten that. But yeah, the women were just like, I guess, getting on his nerves. So he did say that. Uh, but in terms of when he describes the indigenous women with their children and 
and how they cook and, and take care of their, their families. It was all positive, except for the chatterbox reference. And there's, there's one thing, I, just to, to add on to that, you know, there's, it's very, very difficult to, to really try to, to, to read between the lines and reconstruct what's going on in the minds of the native people because all the writings are from the are from barbar Spaniards. But there's one episode, the one that Rosemary was referring to, where I think it's a little bit north of Ensenada. All of a sudden, um, Portola is, is, is amazed and frustrated because out of nowhere, a bunch of Indian women have appeared and they're rummaging through the camp all at once, you know, and, and, and he can't seem to get rid of them. And, and, and he, he, Portola says they're just, you know, blabbering away. What are they doing? Well, so if, if you try to figure out from the point of view of the, of the native peoples what's going on, they probably knew enough about the Spanish to realize that, that the Spanish thought of, of, of women, especially indigenous women, as at best nuisances. So these are the perfect people to run, rummage around the camp and spy about mm -hmm. and try to figure out what kind of weapons they have, what kind of supplies yeah. they have, what their horses are like. So, so probably what's going on here is a deliberate attempt by the native peoples to use the Spanish preconceptions in a way that the Spanish aren't, yeah. aren't expecting them to be used. That's true. And there's another, oh, we'll, we'll be here all day. <laughs> yeah. but there's another incident, it's in Baja California also, where Sarah takes off his spectacles and the, the Indians grab them, especially the women. They start grabbing them and touching them and passing them all around. And he was just getting all frantic. You can just see in his writing, he's getting very frustrated. I need my glasses. And he, he finally is able to wrestle them away from the people. So, like Bob said, you kind of wonder where they, you know, playing him, who knows? <laughs> and, and another unfair question for Bob. Uh, uh, and a, you, you're not supposed to ask historians these kind of questions, but I'm a journalist, sure so I ask right. anyway. Uh, would, the, would the Indians in California have been better off if the missionaries hadn't come with the Spanish, Spanish soldiers, or if the Spanish soldiers and Spaniards had come up by, themse you know, by themselves and left the missionaries back in Mexico, uh, what difference would it have made in the lives of the, uh, of the Indians? Probably, um, there's, so this is a contrafactual question. Yeah. So it actually didn't happen. But um, one of the things that it's important to understand is that, um, and it's, it's hard for us to, to accept this now because, you know, we are, living in California, you know, when it's in American California. But in 1769, if Spain didn't come into California, some other colonial power would have. That was just going to happen, you know, whether it was Russia or France or somebody, you know, they would have come. Uh, so colonialism was just simply part of the warp and woof of, 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 of the experience of many people in the, in the indigenous people in America. Uh, Spanish colonialism usually meant military, civilian and religious. It was a tripod, Presidio Pueblo mission. Uh, if the, the missionaries generally thought of themselves as representing the more humane side of colonialism. Now, whether they always did that or not, you can, you can debate about. But I think that from the point of view of the missionaries, and this is a, this is a, um, a way of looking at things that goes all the way back to, to Las Casas in the 16th century, uh, from the point of view of the missionaries, if you leave settlers and soldiers alone with Indians, they're going to exploit them. They're going to rape the women. They're going to make them work in the ranches and the haciendas. They're going to make them work in the mines. So the only people who are protecting, who can protect the Indians are us. And we protect the Indians by separating them from all the people who or will oppress them like they did. Now, as a matter of, of cold hard fact, the missions turn out to be very unhealthy places for native peoples. Uh, so, if you ask a native, if you ask many native people today, is there what's the great difference between an Indian being treated on a ranch and an Indian being treated on a mission? They say none. From the point of view of the missionaries, there was a tremendous difference. From the point of view of the native peoples, there probably wasn't that much of a difference at all. Terrific. Yes, way in the back there. My name is Megan Redshirt Shaw. Um, I'm Ogallala Lakota. My mom grew up on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Um, so I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, um, in regards to doing your research, did you interact with Native contemporary Native people who are impacted by the colonization that Hunapur Sarah um, 
instigated in, in the state of California and how much that colonization continues to impact indigenous people today. Did you actually sit down with people that continue to be impacted with this for your research? Yes, 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 we did. Um, we gave parts of our book to um, native California friends that we have and asked them to react to it. And the parts of the book that deal with, you know, like what I was just talking about, how to try to get at the native experience from the, through the lines of the Spanish writing, that was very much influenced by, by ways in which we were influenced by talking to native peoples, but also reading a lot of the, um, the literature produced by, uh, by native peoples. There's a, in California, there are a tremendous number of important uh, native California scholars that we've known for a number of years and have really worked with. Ed Castillo, who used to be at Sonoma State, is probably the preeminent one, but there are, there are a whole bunch of others. Yeah, we did do that. We took that very seriously. Honestly, the book would have been different if it had been written by a native person. Yes, absolutely, because we're not. But we tried to do, we tried to do what you suggested. Uh, yes, right here. Sir, the, the, the microphone. Thanks, Jim. During the flogging process, uh, do we know if the priest or the soldiers carried out the flogging? Generally, it was the generally it was the soldiers, uh, but during the sixty-five years of the mission experience, there are recorded instances of some of them being carried out by priests. But generally, it was the soldiers. Okay, thank you. Yes. Is there anything? Uh, my understanding is that the missions were basically along the coast. Is there any comparison available between the impact on the indigenous by the missions and the ind indigenous that lived in, the, say, the Sierras who were not impacted until the gold rush? Well, actually, they, George, they were, uh, the, the, the native peoples in the central, in the central uh, valley were impacted beginning uh, really in the 1810s mainly from trappers coming down from Canada and then um, uh, trappers coming uh, through, uh, you know, spinning off of the rendezvous, which would usually happen in Wyoming. So the trappers would come down, and they would often come down from Oregon down the Central, down, down the central Valley, and they would bring a number of the diseases that, were, that, that the, the people of the Central Valley experienced were diseases, measles especially, that were brought to them by trappers. There's a very famous episode where Jedediah Smith comes in to Mission San Jose in 1827, and but there are a whole bunch of others as well. So yes, yeah, so 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 part of the part of the problem, part of the you know figuring out what the situation in of, um, of diseases and how they affected each other. There's clearly diseases that were brought by the Spanish. There were clearly diseases that were brought by trappers, Canadian and, and American trappers, and how they related to each other is is something that epidemiology. Epidemiology, epidemiological historians are, are actually looking at. There are such things. There's something regarding the illnesses, uh, I just wanted to add quickly. The priests were aware of the illnesses that were affecting the indigenous peoples at the missions. Down at Mission San Lustre, it was Father Perry who said, we need to build some kind of a hospital unit here at this, at this mission to segregate the Indians, and he said, and they need fresh air. So that was, a, they were aware of, of what was happening, and they were aware of the changes in the environment uh, by putting people into closed rooms. It was, as I would say, you know, microbiolandia, so mi microbe land. Uh, the, the Indians were just getting sicker and sicker and sicker when if they had been left at their Indian villages with the fresher air, they wouldn't have had this kind of contamination. Hi, uh, this is a question for both of you. Um, given all of your research and what you learned, um, what are your impressions of whether or not Sarah should be canonized? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we were in Rome at the end of uh, April, beginning of May, and we gave a presentation in Rome about Sarah. Uh, and. We were asked that question many times by the journalists. And we didn't write this book to promote canonization or to say, don't canonize him. This book was started a long time ago. It took 10 years to write. 
And it just happened that the Pope decided to canonize Sarah. And, and as Bob always says, what a great press agent, publicity, you know. <laughs> we didn't plan this. And I, I feel that what we've tried to do is to present Sarah in his own voice. And what we're trying to do is help you to hear what he has to say. You listen to his words as I translated them for you. Hear what he has to say. And you can make up your own, your own mind. Because to paraphrase Pope Francis, who am I to judge what you think? <laughs> who am I to say you should believe that Sarah should be a saint or he should not be a saint? You can make up your own mind. I don't want to impose my opinion. Okay. Yes. Everything that you say. Could you wait for the microphone? So, thank you. Everything that you said in your book about Sarah is written by Sarah, I believe, unless I misunderstood that. The writings by Sarah and then responses to letters, and there are, there are other people who, who write back and respond. So you have Rivera y Moncada, and you have things from Fajes, you have letters from other priests, and Neve, and so we have, we have Sarah, and then we have responses. Okay, I think, it's, I think it's entirely appropriate to ask once more regardless of anything else, should the canonization take place? And for you, and for Father. We'd like your opinion on that. That's why we're here. I, don't, I mean, I'm not a theologian. I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, I can see... You have an opinion, he, though. I, I can see why the Pope did this. The Pope is Latin American. The missions are, have mean much different things in Latin America than they do in California. You know, it's probably not accidental that the Sierra Gorda, you know, is... Uh, is um, um, Populated, it's a rugged, isolated region. It's populated by descendants of the people that Sarah worked with, and there's been no no issue there. You know, and, I, and Archbishop Gomez, born in Mexico, and so so missions mean something different in Latin America than they do in in the, in California and in the U.S. So it's a different kind of of thing. So I mean, I think that uh, um, I can see why the Pope did this. I can see why. Other people on the other side, they'll say, you know, and, and much of our presentation has been saying, Sarah's a man of his times, you know. And I've, I have Native American friends who say, you know, Native California friends, you know, who say, you know, saints should not be men of their times. They should be people who are ahead of their times. And I can understand that, too. Mm -hmm. you know, so. People who transcend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're putting yeah, a moderator on the spot, Richard. Uh, well... <laughs> He's supposed to be I, a I'm not a historian, so I can have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that from, from everything I've heard, I think that Sarah was a holy man. He was a well-intentioned man. Uh, he uh, was a holy man. Uh, but should he be made a saint? Uh, I, I, I don't think someone should be made a saint when there is a large constituency that feels... Uh, this is uh, this is not a good idea. Uh, I feel the same way about Pius the Twelfth. You know, I think he was a good man, a holy man. But when the Jewish community finds this problematic, uh, then I think it's it. You know, we should not. Uh, the church as an institution should not give offense uh, to people. So I would, you know, I, I would think they probably should have, you know. Put it on a back burner, postpone it. Wait until there's greater consensus among everybody that, yeah, okay, this makes sense. Uh, now, I would say, though, in, in support of Pope Francis, is you know, during his last trip to, uh, uh, to Latin America, he specifically apologized for uh, the sins of the church against the native people. Uh, and he emphasized that point, acknowledged it. Uh, the, the Latin American church has been better at doing that than the North American church. Uh, you know, so, um, but in any case, so, I mean, my opinion is not. We shouldn't have done it. We should have, we should have waited, uh, but that's above my pay but grade. But you're not Pope. I'm not Pope. <laughs> that's above my pay grade. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, here's your microphone. Yeah. Almost every um, fourth grader in California in a public school has to do a mission report. And 
from what I've seen, the, the consensus is that, you know, the, it's, the, this was really bad. All they did was harm the Indians. So I think you should write a book for children that has, ex <laughs> that ha I'm serious, that has excerpts from his, his letters that, that express his uh, humanity and kindness. Well, you know, because, uh, no, just because it is, it, I think, you know, when you have a huge segment of the population that come, come out with this idea, it sounds like you have the power to change it in some way. Well, it's, it is actually kind of already happening. Uh, we have some friends who are elementary school teachers in the Richmond area and uh, Marilyn, Marilyn Merlino. And uh, she has used excerpts from our book excerpts of Sarah's writings to talk about uh, how Sarah showed compassion uh, and, and to broaden the, the discussion, to broaden the dialogue. So there are people who are starting to do this. And I think it's, it's a fantastic suggestion, and I hope that it happens. I hope that more people who read the book, and I'm not trying to sell it, I'm being just sincere, who read it and read but Sarah's it is on writings. Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, but seriously, if, if, they, if people can take excerpts from the book and, and put it into a context uh, or at a level where a fourth grade student, and also to help the, help the faculty members uh, do that. That's right. And the common core. Yeah, with the common core. With the common core. I think it's a fantastic idea, because I've seen really silly uh, comic books that have been made about Sarah, and it's almost like he's Sarah, the superhero with his cross, you know, and it's just, it's, it's ludicrous. It's insulting to Sarah. It's insulting to the indigenous peoples. And there needs to be a balanced um, approach. I, I, I like the idea a lot. And I will pass it on to my friend that this question came out. So it's a very, very good suggestion. I, Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, you've got the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just uh, a question for both of you. Um, were there, uh, was there at any point um, you and Paris are reflecting upon the religious syncretism that incurred between the indigenous and Catholic beliefs that went on during the mission period? Yeah, there, yeah. there were some times where he, he seems to have uh, been aware of, um, of um, um, the fact that, that Native peoples continue to practice their own religious folkways. And, you know, what, what, what happens when, when Christianity is brought to the indigenous peoples of California is exactly the same thing that happens when Christianity was brought to you know, the so-called barbarians in the Roman Empire. People interpret that through the perspective of their own religion. This picture that we have on the cover is, is no accident. There's no priest in the picture. Actually, if you turn the book around, the priests are on the side. These are Petaluma Indians. This is done in 1817. These are Petaluma Indians agreeing to enter the mission at San Rafael, which is just the come. They've gone down the Mission Dolores. That's Mission Dolores in the background. That's actually at 16th and Dolores in San Francisco now. Uh, and what, they are, what, what are they doing? They're dancing. They're doing their native dances, their indigenous dances. What they are obviously doing is purif trying to purify the mission so that they can enter it. <laughs> That's what they're doing. You know? And so you have a bunch of these kinds of things. Now, there's one, there's one quote which I love from... It was from Mission uh, San Luis Obispo, I believe, or San Luis Rey. Uh, but it, it San Luis Obispo, when a French um, visitor visited there, and after dinner, the, the Indians the, who were Chumash came out and did their dances in the plaza in front of the church, um, the, the, the Frenchman said, you know, the, 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 the Indians are doing their pagan dances, which the priests, as a matter of policy, pretend not to notice. So I think that that's, you know, most of them realized that there was some kind of syncretism going on and that indigenous Christianity was going to be different from Spanish Christianity. But they realized it somewhere, but they didn't want to say that too, too, too loud. But they realized it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.